got, uh, <laughs> thank you. I've got a few announcements. Um, the first is, uh, this was just found uh, near Humphreys, so if you're missing yours, come see me. Okay, great. Um, so the sign-up sheets for the open mics this week are full. All the spots have been taken. Um, but there are spots on a sign-up sheet that will be in McClurg for a basketball game that Josh Bernstein is putting together for Wednesday at 530. Um, because you know what they say, like if you're good at writing, you'll be great at basketball. So. <laughs> <laughs> I do say that. Um, tonight uh, at 5.30, there's going to be uh, lawn games right out here. And then at 10 p.m. tonight, there's going to be poker in St. Luke's. And it's my pleasure to welcome Danny Anderson. <laughs> The man behind me seethed. The lady behind him kept sighing, clicking her high heel on cold linoleum and scowling at her watch. The checkout boy was making change, snap, snap, one dollar at a time. He popped each bill between his chubby fingertips, glanced two times at the till, then smoothed his singles, fives, and tens down on the countertop. Each time, snap, snap, glance twice and smooth. The line was long and getting longer. Two guys in John Deere hats showed up, a mother and her infant. Good God, I heard somebody say, for crying out loud, kid. One woman slapped a pack of frozen peas against her cheek. The line was getting longer. A plumber, a cop, three busty girls with magazines and Diet Cokes. Did his mother have any children that lived? <laughs> I knew Andrew was going to like that show. The man behind me laughed. The lady just kept clicking her high heel. What happened next? I set my basket on the belt. I said, it's Rodney, right? He thumbed his name tag. He nodded yes. Hey, Rodney, let's get out of here. Forget these jerks. Forget this crappy job. I tried to coax him out the way that one might coax a bashful, beaten dog to come. It's just a job, I said. I may have even whispered this. Come on, it's just a job. He looked at me as if he didn't understand. It's just a job. And he refused at first. All I could hear was someone cracking gum light music overhead, the click, click, clicking of a heel. We'll find you something else. After a lengthy pause, he scanned those fierce, exasperated faces in the line. And finally, he agreed. Someone clapped. Another whooped, hell yes, and praise the fucking Lord. <laughs> he closed the register, stripped off his smock. Then we, we stepped out into 70 degrees. Viburnum bloomed and honeysuckle bloomed. Young parents strolled their baby down the street and kids played wiffle ball. A frail, teetering man clipped rhododendron blossoms from a bush. On my front porch, Rodney sipped ginger ale. I drank fine caramel-colored bourbon on the rocks. It's just, he started to say, then stopped. A cheerful bird, bird, bird insistence sprang throughout the leafy branches of my oaks. It's just, I didn't want to disappoint my dad. I almost called him son. I almost said, your dad, who surely loves you very much, will understand. I almost, almost cupped a gentle hand across his shoulder as he wept. Except, except he didn't weep. He started ringing up my things. 
Then Rodney told me what I owed. He bagged my tonic water and my chips, and he, before he counted back my change, apologized. It's just this thing I have to do. Walking to my car, I only heard the chiming clapper of a welcome bell, the sound of gravel crunching underneath my feet. I have a deep sympathy for the character in that poem, I finally realized, because when I was young, my mother said, she called me in and she said, she gave me the coin purse and a letter. And she said, uh, I want you to mail this letter and buy us a loaf of bread. And I was like, no problem. <laughs> Charge up to the corner store, mailbox on the right, store on the left, open the mailbox, throw the coin purse down the hatch. <laughs> And I turn around and I look at the letter and I'm like, ah! And um, it, it's possible I may have even blacked out. I'm not sure. Um, and I suspect there are a few people in this room who always thought that Wyatt and Andrew had something to do with the way I am, but um, it does go back a little further than that. So, anyway. At Advent's End. In icy Sunday morning light, my neighbor hauls her Christmas to the curb. A snow-flocked noble fir, armloads of garland and a tinseled wreath. These sag and flatten underneath three pregnant garbage bags of liquor bottles, boxes, cookie tins, crushed wrapping paper, ribbon, bows, and nubs of candles spiced with cinnamon, apple, and pine. They've gone, the wise men and the infant Christ, Mary and Joseph too, who had been congregating there in freezing rain and recent sleet under her spotlit ornamental pear. She labors to remove the mint and crimson window lights that sparkled on our dark December street. At last, she hustles out and flings a shriveled little fist of mistletoe on top of all that was, then swivels, leans, and spills a whole bright batch of popcorn from a metal bowl for pigeons huddled on a wire. They fall in soft gray cotton flatteries and muffled claps of flight, when quietly spirits appear of orphaned plans, good intentions, blue maps of all the places that I didn't go, the spent endowment of another year, and January brooding like a ship, luxury births and iced champagne, confetti and a foghorn sending off awaiting all of us, toward what? Sun-crested archipelagos of hope, I'll get more organized. I'll be more punctual and self-possessed, more grateful than I ever was. Our chimneys breathe and sigh at such a moment so immense. Then out of nowhere comes, sorry, then out of nowhere comes a toddler's cry of sirens ranging near until the shrieking blast of city paramedics diesels past, scattering pigeons in a gust of noise and leaving in its wake only the silver shake of sleigh bells being taken from a door. Our houses once again are disappointed, sad, and plain. Inside, where restlessness and boredom grow, the days are shorter than they seem. Some pace the carpet, others play at cards. Some hunkered down beside the fire. In second-story rooms, cluttered with disregarded toys and clothes, stir-crazy children pray for snow. Someone is burning leaves. This season I admire most, this season I sometimes obsess about, goes up in muted gorgeous flame. Hornbeam and leatherwood, locust and larch, the frosty lace bark elm and mountain silver bell combust in pumpkin color and the gold of corn. 
Somewhere, someone is burning leaves, and evening is weighted with a taste of hickory and steel, with leaf meal and the coolness of decay. We found each other after all this time. Somebody said he'd died. Another said she thought he'd been in prison. But Jeffrey Day is very much alive. Not only that, he's never spent a night in jail. He calls me on the weekends in the fall, most times more than a little drunk. He had two houses and a boat, a jet ski and a kick-ass pickup truck, a couple DUIs and shit. He'd lost it, lost it all. But Jeffrey Day could play some ball, he often interjects. A speedy, lean, wasp-waisted kid through peewee and in junior high, a standout wide receiver senior year, and then a freshman season on the squad at Long Beach State. But now his hands are like fat slabs of country ham, nicked up from carpentry and warehouse work. He's blown his back, his ankles, and his knees. He hunches and he lumbers when he walks. That's right, the boy could play some ball. Mid-sentence, I can hear the puncture and the carbonated spray of long-lost Jeffrey Day cracking another can of beer. We love you, Danny Anderson. Now, we're not gay or anything like that. It's just, we love you, baby. You be safe. One recess during lunch. This must have been the sixth or seventh grade. I watched him saunter up and cold cock Kenny Ambrose in the mouth. No reason whatsoever. Smack. And Kenny Ambrose never said a word. He didn't even cry. He just looked horrified at me at first, then Jeffrey Day, and back at me again. Remember that. Jeff jabbed his finger straight at Kenny's face before he pivoted and skipped away. That childhood we survived diminishes with every year and smells this very night like someone somewhere burning leaves. The cellars prosper now with onion, apple, parsnip, beet, and yam. The cupboards bulge with canning jars of stewed tomatoes, cucumbers, and beans. Remember that. I do. Exhausted garden flowers singe and brown, and somewhere to the north, the crisping north, a river's water blackens in the cold. Yes, Jeffrey Day, we love you too. Um, I kind of went back and forth on that poem and in the end decided to conflate a couple of episodes and uh, Jeff Day was, as you, you, you may have been able to tell, was mildly sociopathic as a child and maybe today too, but um, when he went up and he hit this guy named Kenny Ambrose in the mouth, he didn't say anything really, he just smacked him. And then he turned to me and gave me this kind of nod as if I was complicit. And, um, and I, looked at, I, was, I looked at Kenny, I said, no, I, you know, I didn't have anything to do with this. Um, but it's, it's interesting because uh, Jeff Day was this really amazing athlete. I was not. And um, he convinced me on more than one occasion to go out for the football team. And, um, and one day in practice, um, I was playing about as far away from any action as the coaches could get me. And um, our quarterback threw, this was in the eighth grade, our quarterback threw a pass. It was just this fat floating duck. And it came right at me and I caught it, which astonished me. And um, before I could even take my first step running, Jeff Day was there. And he lifted me up and he threw me down on the ball. And, and it totally knocked the wind out of me. And I could hear my fellow scrubs gather around me and let out this collective, whoa. <laughs> and, um, and I managed to get to my feet and Jeff Day says, remember that. And I'm like, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> you know, I don't know. So. Anyway. So. <laughs>
I didn't, yeah, so there we go. Um, Epithalamian in a minor key. Having caught him in a slight and thoroughly inconsequential lie, we watched him turn from us and wade into a small, elegant cartel of women beneath a water oak where he now smokes a cigarette alone. The evening has the glazed, enameled look of ornamental eggs. Tree branches are laced with paper lanterns and necklaces of tiny ivory lights. Filled water goblets gleam. The bride-to-be, wearing a lemon cocktail dress and pearls, seems chiseled from the very sun. We know few people here and find ourselves in conversation with a gas and oil man from Baton Rouge, two groomsmen, and the shy, well-meaning priest, a surgeon from Rhode Island, and then we're somehow milling next to him again. He'd like to clarify a certain thing he may have said before. We wave it off. Don't be absurd. This weekend, all our causes are benign. We mingle. We manage to avoid opinion and belief, conservative and liberal, hawk and dove, Big Ten and SEC. No one, so far as I can tell, is giving anybody grief over abortion or Afghanistan, gay marriage or the Fed. We are overly solicitous instead, accommodating and sarcasm free. Nobody scoffs or cracks the sneer that says, you poor uneducated schmuck, you've swallowed all the propaganda, eh? Miraculously, we find only pleasantries to say about the long distances we've come and the picture-perfect weather. We praise this rented stone estate, its columns, the Italian marble stairs, and dazzling cut glass chandelier. We remark how smitten they both look, the almost bride and nearly groom we are here to celebrate. Tomorrow in the stained glass chapel light, wood polish and the pepper scent of lilies hanging in the godly air, a few may cry. A few may privately suppose there are no happy endings waiting there. Someone will screw around or worse, someone will have to watch the other die. To see them though, so pleased, so dashing, so poised and overjoyed, it isn't difficult to think these just may be the seldom two who will never raise their voices in a rage or covet some lost solitude, whose gentle, healthy children will obey, whose mild hearts may on occasion drift as even sometimes mild hearts will do, though never truly stray. After the psalm and organ-driven hymns, after the homily, the vows, that kiss, wishing them happiness, if nothing else, we wish them this. Mel. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that. There's an Andrew Jackson in your future, my friend. <laughs> I'll get to you later. Okay. I'm out. I'm out. You're squeezing me dry. Okay. Reading history. When the president is overthrown and the parliament dissolved, when cabinet ministers are jailed, it will occur to them, though briefly so, to gather their asset assets in haste and flee. When fool and laureate are hanged, the daughters raped, when all that was forbidden once, the carnage and the lust, becomes the order of the day, they will adjust. How strangely then their happiness will seem remote, they will relinquish livestock, the lands, and the good view, those mild pastures, the forests, and the clear trout streams. 
They will no longer calculate the rate of their returns, summer by the lake, or stroke the dog's soft jaw at dusk. Nor will they take their drinks at six, the cool tonics with lime. They will remember how one sunny day in June, the constable addressed a crowded briefing room to reassure the press the bloody crackdown would resume. That all belongs to a different time, a different dream for the royalist supporters of the previous regime. In here, out there. These acorns from the storm-tormented tree rain down a madness overhead, exploding intermittently as if they'd wake the lazy dead. But it's 3 a.m. and nothing now is rousing them. It's only me instead who hears the rapid hammer work that wrathful smack of seed against the roof. And it is clear to draw the curtain back and scan my tranquil street from here that all or most are still at rest. There doesn't seem to be a reading lamp or a faint blue television glow in all the houses down the row. No, they've chosen different shade, maple, maybe pine. I'm certain they're not sleeping under oaks, but surely if they were, they'd understand this desire of mine to take a freshly sharpened ax, to rage and split, and take each meaty log, have and quarter it, then cinder each last log to ash. I'd watch that tree ride skyward in its noiseless smoke on a night like this, high wind and fog, until that oak and all my raging too would seem the blousy substance of a dream. A mile away, someone, it may be you, might catch the spice of wood smoke on the moist air and think or even start to say to someone else how nice the night would be beside a fire. You wouldn't spend a thought on why that fire came to be and scarcely could you comprehend the plot. Acorns and acorns shaken from their tree, beating on the brain of one who turns his sleepless inward looking eye on failures and regrets, his doubts, his sorrows. They multiply as ragged fog banks bluster by. He hears not just the winds and oaks commotion in his ears, but woeful, stupid, half-cocked things he sometimes said. Glass rattling in the gust, warp and boom, sway and bow. He has had enough of worry's calculus for now and of the oak, treek's ni oak tree's nightmare head. Already from his tossed and twisted bed, he notices the way the blue blackness in his window has started purling into gray. It won't be long. The night will soften into sallow dawn, and then he won't think much of fire, the ax, the varnish of its helve, or you. He'll listen as those north by northwest gales begin to die, as all such weathers do. He may feel troubled for a day, perhaps a few, to see the first of cold October's leaves spun up and scattered on the ashen sky, hearing a boot sole scuffing on the walk or raw bitching of a crow's cry. A la belle étoile, which is French, which I do not speak. <laughs> Literally, it, it translates to under the beautiful star, colloquially in the open night air. It's late. Even our flight attendants drowse. And 20,000 feet below, Vermont is pillowed safely in snow. Across that dove gray nether world, a night shift worker navigates her car. Her headlights veering like a ruined star toward several cottages that house mysterious and forbidden lives. What is it that we see out there? We sleepless passengers who stare where the moon and pewter clouds carouse. Or on the starboard aisle, 
who eye those shifting galaxies and nebulae, star-dusted far-off Syracuse, Rochester glittering, and Buffalo. Some read detective novels, some the lacquered glamour ads in magazines, while others study lace and fern of frost feathering the plexiglass. Cleveland, Mansfield, then Columbus pass like cities winter deep in fireflies. Oh my good gosh, Millinocket Lake? A woman's gingham voice behind us cries. We used to spend our summers there. I hate to say this, but the world is small, the liver-spotted man beside her sighs. And maybe you can nearly start to see old Millinocket Lake, the family camp where it is always 1963, July, and smoky and a little damp. The cabin is tobacco dark inside, fishing tackle tangled at its door, sand sprinkled on its thinly varnished floor. All day the oscillating fan's blade nick, nick, nicking at its metal cage. Grandfather on the dock at his easel, painting the children in the birch canoe. Snapdragon yellow sun, trees beetle green. Such North Atlantic rarities in blue. Our destination smolders into view. A phosphorescent cluster on the south. And Millinocket goes the way of each refinery and farm, each tinseled hamlet over which we've flown. Our Boeing dips its wing. We hear the high accelerating whine, the chuck and grumble of the landing gear. Then suddenly the cosmic and the vast sharpen to particulars at last. Those candelabra, that bright chandelier, the distant cigarette and all, enlarge as through a looking glass, to vacant lot and spotlit salvage yard, smokestack and the Methodist spire. Warehouses ribbed with razor wire are haloed in a carbide glow. Yet even from here, this simple height, this jurisdiction of the common crow, the inex inexplicable, unjust, and sad seem comfortably nestled among the paisley checkerboard and plaid facade of Nashville, Tennessee, where just a little while from now, the clenched young woman sitting next to me will watch the beige and hollow length of her apartment building hall jangle her copper keys and formulate the very last thing she should have said, exact and ruthless, to her new ex-lover sleeping soundly in his bed this time of night in ice-bound Montreal, where she would rather be instead. The Hills, Beautiful Hills. The attic still smells of boredom. Sawdust, mothballs, and the rain I climbed up here to watch decades ago as it congealed softly into Sunday snow. I've come again to lose myself among these stale, outdated clothes, bad landscape paintings, a stern dressmaker's dummy and a fox, the rusty eyeless stole that guards it all. That was a flyby I arranged there. <laughs> Frame needlepoints, mismatched crutches, and paper, a paper sack of agates, and postcards. Niagara Falls, Mount Rushmore, and the Hoover Dam. Or this one here, in which an ice green Chrysler glides through autumn in New England. The woods are writhing and alive, emphatic with persimmon hues, with nectarine and plum. But in the old Dutch master's boxes, these packs and mackerel satter fields, and all these silver splashed dements suggest an age of mercury, magnesium, and lead. In living rooms, the color of trout, in low slung kitchens stained with cigarette and iron skillet smoke, on rickety porches looking out across magnetic Appalachian fields, 
My disappointed, coy, and awkward kin seem always caught distracted on some lonely lane of thought and bothered into smiling when they would rather not. It's easier to love them now, Aunt Bernadette and her afflicted son, our brill-creamed uncle and his second wife, the snowy-headed feeble few whose bedsides reeked of vapor rub and tea, and all these tarnished dead I never knew, canasta players, servicemen, a graduating class of nurses, and this barefooted, nameless little girl who walks her nickel-eyed, emaciated hound. Listen, you can nearly hear the moist and muffled static sound of a half-tuned radio, but it's just the rain on the roof that drowns the rowdy laughter down below. The cackle, tease, and boast of cousins on a raw November day, who, having warmed themselves with wine, will shortly feast on simmered apples, yeast rolls, and a roast. How pleased and mild he looks here, our granddad Claude, relaxing in the old savannah swing in what must be his 66th or 67th year. His days, they say, grew deeper into silence, darker into doubt. Was it the child they lost in 17, the two world wars in which he never fought? The heart attack. Was it the prison term that no one ever talks about? His charcoal sweater zippered to the chin. He lets the clear, thin light of early spring rinse over him. Meanwhile, those West Virginia hills behind him roll away, diminishing like love or memory or even loss in galvanized percentages of gray. Teaching the Merchant of Venice. They reek of alcohol and sweat. My Thursday morning students who proclaim it's party week. It's only 8 a.m. Imagine my dismay. Is it so goddamn easy to forget, an inner voice inquires, that you would have been hung over too? Bloodshot, if even here at all, you self-righteous jerk. Daydreaming about intercourse, longing for bed and leering out. On those soft golden cello notes of sun, the mustard yellow maples in the misty mid-October air. Fine. So I blunder on about the play's sundry problems, Antonio's ennui, these ruthless Christians and the squeamish coexistence of the comic and the cruel, etc., etc. They bear it with a patient shrug. Not 30 minutes in, I see it shining there. Act 3, Scene 1, ever so slightly coiled, a strand of Susan Kelly's chestnut hair. It is her Shakespeare, after all, or was, rather, until she graduated, packed her life, left me her books and ten-speed bike, then shipped to Africa for mission work. Outside, the glossy autumn morning grows cantankerous with several squabbling crows. Their fracas punctuates the drowsy, leaden silences in here. We'll write, we told ourselves. We'll call. Two years from now, we'll pick up just where we left off. Things seldom end so well. Hilarious Toledo girl, blue-eyed, briefly imagined college bride who figured that I wouldn't understand the loneliness, the stress, the other boy. They planned, not then exactly, but in time, to wed. She cried a little, then was gone. When she apologized, it's true, I didn't understand. Forgive me, Susan Kelly, for the stunned and sulky undergraduate I was. I've certainly forgiven you, wherever you are now, where it is surely apple season two, if not homecoming week, when all our ghosts of being young are born. These sophomores fidget in their seats, their pens make curly cues, fish nets, 
primitive huts, flowers and fields. Bassanio, Portia, Tubal, Shylock, all are waiting in another room where love and justice doubt that any of us ever gets it right. I'd like to look her up sometime, not out of jealousy or lust or anything like spite, but maybe just to have a laugh, to say I found this strand of your brown hair, etc., etc. And by the way, I went to Venice once. I saw the white Rialto, the great Basilica, and the Piazza San Marco. I stood a while and gazed into those questionably green, unsavory waters of the Grand Canal. It was autumn. The light was quite magnificent, a bluish gold. I know that it's been years and this is anybody's guess, but still, I think you'd like it there. The Night Guard at the Wilberforce Hotel. The drunks on 17, three San Antonio conventioneers, snoggle at long last in their clean beds. A naked man on five has woken to the latch and click of someone's lock, only it's his. And clear as Christmas crystal, there he is, dream dazzled in the hall, not even so much as a shower cap to hide behind. A guest on 12 is calling to complain about the Indiana newlyweds whose bucking headboard batters at her wall. <laughs> They've heard it also on the floor below, that beastly thumping racket as if the whole ceiling could cave in like something horrifying out of Poe. <laughs> But for the moment he is paused over a pleated mound of towels, a chilled half-eaten omelet on a plate, and cigarette stubbed in the last flat golden ounce of champagne in a flute outside room 728. He listens as a woman cries, and all at once it's 1954. That was Kenosha. He is 10. A sleepless, bathrobed little boy studying, studying the thin strip of butter-colored lamplight underneath his mother's bedroom door. Though it's been more than 50 years, it is her quiet weeping that he hears as an old radiator knocks and whistles at the cold. Then he is jostled by an elevator bell or just the hoarse pea gravel sound of someone making ice. Regardless, he is gone almost as softly as he first appeared back to the handsome chandeliered and par mar polished marble lobby where the night clerk and the married concierge flirt purely out of boredom's sake. Those rising and those still awake look out on cargo ships inching through metal-colored lanes across the rain-strafed lake. Pardon and Amnesty. A month ago, ice faceted the willow. Our first forsythia and daffodils were stunned beneath a pellet glaze of sleet. And for a raw few days, the punk of winter fires reclaimed our dismal street. But other flowers now are freshly sunned. Flamingo pink azaleas in the rose. A dust of violets blurs the college lawn, and all these creamy dogwoods, having tussled out of bud, enjoy a dry, delicious April flood of greenery and shine. A colleague I despise has brought his freshman class outside. <laughs> Gathered like goslings at his feet, some nod, some pick at grass. Wind flips the unread pages of their books. It's poetry, I overhear him say. <laughs> the spirit's ancient longing voice, a pure expression of the human soul. He is all hot. He, yeah, you know this guy. Um, he is all hogwash and hot air. 
But even in the blossom-softened trees, the cardinals and the mockingbirds declare it's just that kind of day for song, for saying something generous or grand, or at the very least, not small. And Jesus Anderson, what's wrong with that? Besides, his students tend to like him more than they like you. <laughs> I wonder when that started being true, or rather when it started meaning less. Like tufted white chiffon, clouds cruise the stained glass blue Ohio sky. And in the golden post-meridian decline of afternoon, groundskeepers weed and mow. To them, we're just two lucky bastards who teach twice a week, then take the summers off. Surely we must be chums. No shot in hell. Fat chance. And yet, these days it gets more difficult to find reasons to not be kind. Aprils are fewer now. Perhaps that's why. Or maybe I just finally understand silence and letting be are better things. I should be better at them than I am. Thanks.